Hi guys, today I wanted to talk a little bit about debugging 6502 based systems and what we can do to uh, investigate what's going wrong when they're not working. So in order to demonstrate that, uh, I've built this new 6502 based computer circuit on the breadboard here. Uh, this is just the basic Garth Wilson primer circuit, uh, the same, same one that Ben Benita uses in his videos. So we've got an oscillator, a quad NAND, uh, 6502, some RAM and some ROM. And I haven't put any I.O. on this board at all, uh, because I won't need it for this demonstration. And in the room I've programmed this code, which is a very basic sort of test program. Uh, it's starting from FF00 here, so it's filling the ROM up with zeros up to that point. So I'm only using the top, uh, the top 200, 256 bytes of the ROM. Uh, we set the stack pointer, um, then we do a loop over the X register from 0 to 255. Then we do inside that we do loops over the Y register from 0 to 255 um, and for each of these uh, loops with the Y register uh, we uh, do a kind of sum and we write it to memory. We make sure it got written correctly and if it fails I've made it branch to a specific address. Um, and again down here it's writing to page 1 and if that fails it's going to branch to this address here. Um, it increases y, if it's not 0 then it loops again, so we'll do that for the entire page of memory. And then what, we, what I'm doing is I'm doing exactly the same thing again, uh, but this time I'm only reading from the locations, I'm not writing to them. And these branch to another two kind of fail locations here. Um, once the whole thing is done it loops on x and if it succeeds it branches to pass. Now what I've done down here is uh, I've uh, made it pad out to FF70 just so that there's a very recognizable address uh, and then I've created the pass label here with just an infinite loop and then I've just created each of the other labels that I'm using to indicate failure with infinite loops as well. So if one of the uh, tests above fails uh, we can tell which one failed by which loop it ends up stuck in. So that's the general idea here. Uh, the reason for these two separate loops up here is that the first one is writing to a location then immediately checking that the write succeeded. Uh, the second loop here is just reading from the location and making sure that the value that was previously written to it is still there. So the first one makes sure that writing a memory location works. The second loop uh, is checking that it didn't corrupt anything else while it was writing them. So that's the basic memory test program I'm going to run. But in order to see what's going on we're going to need a way to monitor this circuit. Now Ben Eater uses an Arduino Mega for that, which is cool and everything. Um, but what he's doing with that is he's connecting all of the address bus pins of the 6502 to the Arduino, Arduino Mega and all of the data bus pins as well. So you've got 24 pins uh, from the 6502 are connected over here. Then there's a bunch of control lines he connects as well, like the read versus write line, uh, the clock obviously, and things like that. Um, and, and you've got a whole bunch of signals that you're sampling on the Arduino Mega. But the Arduino Mega isn't fast enough to do that at a very good clock speed. Uh, so that only really works at quite slow speeds, and ideally with the Mega itself generating the clock. So it's quite restrictive. It's not very good for diagnosing problems with uh, a system like the, the, the very fast one I have over here, for example. It would never work for that. And even this one, I think this is a 2 MHz or 1.8 MHz oscillator, so uh, that's probably too fast for the Arduino Mega. But what I wanted to show you today instead of the Arduino was this. It's the Cypress FX2 Easy USB. These things are fairly cheap. They only cost about 10 to 20 pounds. Uh, it's a 16 channel logic analyzer. It allows us to do essentially what Ben Eater was doing with the Arduino Mega. We can sample pins from the CPU using this and we can stream them over USB to the PC. And it streams at uh, USB 2 rates, which is pretty fast. I'll, I'll, I'll mention that a little bit more later on. Now I'm not going to do a full tutorial on how to set this up in this video, I just want to show you, show, show you it's in action. There are good in-depth guides online about how to set these up, so it's probably best to follow that instead of anything that I'd show you in a video. But what I do want to do in this video is demonstrate exactly how powerful and useful this can be uh, when diagnosing 6502 based systems, especially when you're running in multiple megahertz range. Anything above 1 megahertz is too fast for the Arduino, and um, this actually works pretty well even at 30 megahertz on, on, on this board over here or 32 megahertz. So what I'm going to do here is plug this into a PC with USB here. I'm actually plugging it into a, a Linux computer. There is software available for Windows as well, but I don't know much about that I'm afraid. Now with that plugged in I'm going to connect uh, the ground of the uh, FX2 
to the ground of my circuit. So I've, I've left it unpowered while I make the connections. Uh, this white wire, I'm gonna just, just gonna leave that unplugged for now. These colorful wires uh, need to go to the data bus. Um, they're connected to specific pins on the FX2 that it's going to be sampling from. Let me get that resistor out of the way before it shorts something. Uh, so these just connect in order. So we've got black, brown, red, orange, and then yellow, green, blue, purple. Um, now, those of you who are good at counting will notice that that's not 24 pins, or you know, that's not that's not enough to connect to everything on the 6502. In fact, we're only going to connect this to the data bus. We're not going to sample the address bus at all. You might think that that's not going to get us anywhere, but uh, I'll show you an amazing piece of software later on, which will actually make that incredibly powerful thing to do. This purple wire here uh, needs to connect to the clock, and I'm going to connect it actually to. Uh, the output clock from the 6502 rather than the input clock. Um, the manufacturer of this processor doesn't recommend using that output signal, uh, but it is slightly delayed and I actually find it gets, it gets slightly better results using this logic analyzer if I connect it to that. So I'm going to do that and ignore the manufacturer's recommendation. So that's all the connections we need to do to make this work. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is run a command on the computer to actually do a capture um, and this is the command we're going to run we're going to use we're using a program called fx2 pipe and what this does is it tells the fx2 that we want to read data from whatever it's sampling um, there are two modes we're going to use fx2 pipe in today uh, this mode is suitable for slow clock speeds less than seven megahertz it's called asynchronous uh, hence the minus a here and then the minus 8 here means that uh, it's only sampling 8 bits, that the FX2 can do 16 bits. And in fact, you can use that to, c to capture additional control signals from the 6502, which can be helpful. Um, but it's not essential, so I don't do that. Um, this parameter tells it how many samples we're going to collect. So we're going to collect 2 million samples, and it's going to collect the samples on the falling edge of the clock signal that's going in on this purple wire here. And I'm going to capture that to a file I've just called data z.bin. So I can run that now. Uh, nothing will actually happen uh, because there's no power to my circuit at the moment. I haven't plugged the power in and it and it's won't actually capture any data until it sees some clock pulses. So that's handy. I'm going to um, plug it in and then it will immediately start capturing. So there it goes and you can see it captured uh, the samples there. It's a bit odd that it went backwards on the screen. I don't know why it does that. It always does that for me though, but it's kind of giving a progress indication of how much data it captured. So let's have a look at what that data is. Um, I'm going to use XXD to do a hex dump of it. So that's data z.bin. And let's open it in, in Vim in read-only mode to just to see what's there. So this is the data it captured. Uh, some zeros, some FFs, um, nothing particularly interesting here. But what's actually happened here is when the power was applied to the circuit, uh, the oscillator started ticking and the FX2 then started capturing, but the circuit wasn't really ready to go yet. It was still in the reset state, so nothing was really happening here. But I've just scrolled down now 20% uh, of the way through the file and finally we start seeing some activity here. So this is logging all of the values that the FX2 saw on the data bus uh, on the falling edges of the Phi2 clock. Uh, and if you know what you're doing, you can actually read these numbers and figure out exactly what the CPU was doing. So I'm going to take a guess here that this uh, combination here, this 00FF, uh, that, that'll be the CPU reading the reset vector. So it read the low byte, which was 0, and the high byte, which was FF. And then it started running the code. So A2 is the opcode for LDX with an immediate uh, value to, to load into the X register. And the value we wanted to load was FF. Um, and then 9a will be the opcode for TSX. And if we look back at the code, you can see that that's, uh, that's, the, that's the first few instructions of the program up here. Uh, so then we're expecting an LDX of 0, then an LDY of 0, then a TXA. So let's look out for those. Um, so we said A2 was LDX, didn't we? Uh, so this, this A2 will actually be part of the 9A uh, T, TXS uh, op operation. It's a dummy read that it does after that. This is the opcode for uh, LDX being read, and then the 0 gets put into the X. A0 is the opcode for LDY, and then it's going to put 0 in that as well over here. 
Um, and yeah, so reading through the data bus bytes and figuring out what it does by hand is quite difficult and tedious, but David Banks has written this amazing tool uh, which, just like magic, does it all for us. So what this program does is it looks at the data on the data bus and decodes it into the exact instructions that the CPU was executing. So for example, you can see here that it saw the CPU reading from FF00 and from FF01, it got A2 and FF, and then the decoder disassembles that into an LDX FF instruction. The next thing it sees is a, is a read of 9A from FF02, and it disassembles that into a TXS instruction. So yeah, this is exactly what we just did by hand, but the decoder just does it for us, so it's much simpler. Now, the decoder also simulates exactly what the CPU is doing internally, and it has to do this because we're only actually sampling the data bus. We didn't sample the address bus or the control lines uh, from the CPU, things like read versus write and things like that. Uh, so in order to know the context of what the 6502 was doing on a particular bus instruction, the decoder has to internally simulate the 6502 so that it knows if it was the 6502 in the circuit, what it would be doing. And that is how it knows, for example, that the first instruction here, the A2, was at FF00. It knows that because it saw the reset sequence, uh, which included the CPU reading the reset vector from FFFC and FFFD. Uh, so so, so the, the decoder noted that, and that is how it knows what the program counter should be for this first instruction. So a lot of what you see on the screen is deduced. Uh, you can also see on the right-hand side of all the instructions over here a register dump of the internal state of the 6502. Now obviously the decoder doesn't know exactly what's going on in the, one, in the 6502 in the circuit, but it does know what its simulated one is doing at that time, and they should match. It's aware that it doesn't know the value for the A register, but it does know the value for the X register here, FF, because it's just loaded it. Uh, the Y register and the stack pointer are still unknown. Uh, the negative flag is set because it's loaded FF into the X register. That'll set the negative flag. Overflow flag it doesn't know the state of. Uh, decimal is always off after a reset. Interrupt flag is always one after a reset. And zero flag uh, is false here because FF is not zero. Oh, and the carry is, not, and the carry is unknown at the end as well. So you can see on the next line down after the TXS instruction, you can see that now it knows the stack pointer is FF. Um, and then a bit further down here, there's an LDY0 instruction. So after this one, it knows the value for the Y register. Then we have a TXA, so now it knows what's in the A register. And you quickly get to a point where pretty much all of the register states are known. Oh, there's a clear carry next as well. There we go. So the, the, the carry is clear. The only one that's not set here, known as here is the overflow flag. Oh, and that gets, yeah, okay, there's an ADC on the next line down. So that's, that's now set the overflow flag. This means that the decoder now knows the entire internal state of the 65CO2 in the circuit. Uh, so that's pretty incredible after only like five or six instructions. And from this point on, the, the decoder can very reliably dump all of the instructions that the 6502 is executing. It even knows things like this branch instruction. There's a branch if not equal here, and uh, the, the zero flag was set here. Uh, so the branch will not be taken. So it knows that this branch instruction will not be taken. It's only two cycles long. And obviously that kind of thing is very important for um, keeping in sync with what the real CPU is doing. Um, so yeah, this is running the program that, that I wrote, and I mentioned that this system doesn't have any actual output capability. Um, that was intentional because I knew I was going to be running the decoder on it, and I can use the decoder to see what it did, so I didn't really need any output, and I just left that out because I wanted a very quick and simple circuit to build. Uh, but let's have a look and see which of the loops it ended up in. I can go right to the end of the file, actually, and that is stuck doing branch to FF78. So let's have a look back at the code and see how well that code did. Ah, it didn't work. It's failed somehow. So, okay, so FF70 is where these branch branches start. Uh, the pass branch would be at FF70, so, the, so it's not the pass branch that it's got stuck in. Uh, W0 fail will be at FF72. Uh, W1 fail will be FF74. R0 fail at FF76. So R1 fail is the one that's failed. So uh, that is up here. So now we know that this instruction executed. Uh, so in fact, it means that the comp instruction here, the compare failed. So now I look at this code and knowing that this is the instruction that actually uh, failed here, or this is the uh, comparison that failed, uh, I can immediately spot the problem with what I've done here. What I intended to do uh, was write to zero page in the first line and page one in the second line here. 
and, and then compare zero page in the first line and page one in the second line. What I've actually done is I've put the wrong number here. This should this should be a dollar one hundred, not just a one here. So, so in fact, both lines here are just overwriting things in page zero. Um, and by the time uh, in this one gets to run, the location it's comparing was actually probably overwritten by the next cycle of this loop. Now there's a lot of bugs you can't diagnose just by looking at the code like this, even if you know exactly which bit went wrong. Maybe the code's more complicated and hard to understand, and you're less likely to have just intuition about what's right or wrong about that sort of thing. And the decoder can be incredibly helpful for that as well. So here I've switched back across to the decoder and I've scrolled up to find the point at which uh, the uh, BNE FF78 instruction was executed. And we can immediately see here what was actually going on during the comp instruction. Now these lines above the comp instruction represent the memory operations that were executed during the comp instruction. Uh, and you can see uh, on the right hand side here what value is in the accumulator. So the accumulator had 0D in it. And the memory operations here are loading the uh, opcode of the comp instruction, then the operand is two bytes of operand here because it's an absolute address on the comp there. Um, and this last read here comes from 0001 and that is reading 13 from memory location 001. So the comp instruction is comparing 13 with 0d and they're obviously not the same. So it's not really necessary in this case because the bug was so simple, but in more complex cases you might want to know what actually wrote 1.3 into memory location 0001, and that's very easy to find out. We just need to search backwards for WR0001, and we'll find that it was written by an STA 0000,y instruction. So this is very much like uh, using a modern PC real-time debugger, except it's not real-time. We have a complete capture of everything that happened during program execution, so it's even more powerful than using a modern debugger. Uh, we can go backwards in time as well as step forwards in time, uh, for example, which is hugely useful. But yeah, I think that illustrates pretty well how useful the decoder can be for debugging software errors. But when we're building homebrew computers, software errors aren't the only thing we have to contend with. We also have to diagnose hardware errors. Um, so let's create a hardware error and see what that might look like in the decoder. So I'm not quite sure how much to break it really, because um, I don't want it to completely not run at all. Um, but what I might do is just pull one of these wires out. This is one of the address lines that leads to the RAM. Um, so without that, it's probably not going to do a very good job of writing to RAM. So with that removed, let's rerun the capture. Um, I'm going to call it I'm going to capture to Z2 this time. Uh, disconnect the power. Run the capture program. Plug the power in. Let it do the capture. I'll disconnect it again now. And we can run the decoder on Z2 and see what looks different. Now I skipped over this in the last one, but uh, the start of the decoded file here tends to contain a load of rep repeated data at the start, and this is because the system was still booting up when the FX2 started capturing samples. So the, C the system was actually stuck in reset at this point, and in that case there, there tends to be a constant address and uh, hence constant data on the, on the buses there. Um, so what you tend to have to do is just search for reset. and you'll find where the decoder saw the reset happening. Um, so again, we can see the program executing here, um, but, but I wonder what happens differently this time. Okay, well there's straight away there's something different. Um, and this is actually an interesting thing to explain. So the decoder is simulating the 6502 uh, internally, but I also gave it a command line argument to tell it to simulate the contents of the memory as well. So every time there's a write to memory, uh, it remembers what value was written and whenever it sees a read from memory, it verifies that the same value that was written before is actually the one that gets read back. And this kind of memory modeling failure message here means that that wasn't the case. So it's telling us that at address 0001, it expected to see 0D, but it actually saw 1.3 instead. So this, uh, this error happened during the comp instruction, and the comp is comparing 0001, y against what's in the accumulator. 
and this is executing immediately after an STA instruction that would have stored the accumulator at that location. So that's why the decoder is saying, hang on, that's got the wrong value. You can also see as part of the SDA instruction uh, that the CPU did correctly put 0D on the data bus uh, during the write to 0001. But you can see as uh, during the comp instruction uh, when there was a read from 0001, the RAM in response didn't put 0D on the data bus, it put 13 instead. So this doesn't tell us whether the write or the read actually failed here. It just tells us that what, what the decoder saw wasn't what it expected. Um, it, it could be that the RAM is in read-only mode, maybe the, maybe the write-enable signal is not connected to the RAM, uh, or in this case what's, ha what's, what's happened is I've disconnected one of the address lines and maybe the read and the write actually happened to different addresses because that address line wasn't correctly connected. It is still up to you to look at the hardware and see if you can figure out why these uh, modelling failures happen. Now I want to also show you uh, the other mode of operation for FX2 pipe because I said earlier on that the reason we can't use an Arduino for this is because the clock speed is too fast for the Arduino uh, and this is this is currently running at 2 megahertz. But this mode I'm running the FX2 in at the moment, uh, the asynchronous mode, uh, that only supports clock speeds up to about 7 or so megahertz. So I'm not, not sure exactly where the cutoff is. Uh, I think Dave Banks on his GitHub wiki has uh, Bit more notes on that kind of thing. Above that clock speed uh, you're not going to get enough samples uh, to reliably sample the data bus uh, at, the, at the falling edge of the of the Phi2 clock and things will start to get unreliable. So in order to get around that we can switch to what's called synchronous mode of FX2 pipe um, and this works a little bit differently so let's uh, reconfigure the circuit to do that. In the synchronous mode uh, we need the signal that was previously connected to the clock and um, that, that kind of needs to be low in order for sampling to happen um, and you can you can just connect it to ground I tend to connect it to the inverted reset signal instead though so that's what I've got over here and then this extra wire I have here needs to connect to the clock instead so I'll just do that here on the oscillator and that'll be fine so what's going to happen in this mode is the actual clock that drives the FX2 for its general computation is going to come from this circuit rather than coming from this oscillator over here. And because this oscillator is driving the FX2, it means the FX2 will naturally sample the data bus at the right time. And this keeps them in, in lockstep with each other, which allows a much higher sampling rate overall. I think the maximum clock that the FX2 can support is 48 megahertz, which is way more than you're ever going to get out of a 6502. Um, and you actually end up being more limited by USB bus bandwidth uh, before you reach that point anyway. But I've had this working fairly well at 32 megahertz on this computer um, and very stably at 25 megahertz on my breadboard computer. So with those changes there, I'm going to swap the oscillator around. So this synchronous sampling mode only works with clock speeds above about 7 megahertz. Uh, the FX2 itself can't run at very slow clock speeds so that's why you do need to know which of the two modes you want to use for a particular thing but I'll put that, that oscillator in there, that's a 10 MHz oscillator so that's above the minimum frequency for the FX2 when I'm using it in this mode I'm going to plug the power in straight away um, because I connected the uh, purple wire here to the inverted reset signal uh, the, the FX2 actually won't sample during the reset period which gives, uh, which gives much tidier captures as a result in order to do this version of sampling, we need to say if click equals x i, I think, um, and let's capture that to z three dot bin instead now. I'm holding the reset button when I start the capture, and you can see it's not capturing anything. And when I release the reset button, it will start capturing samples, and it very quickly got them all. The way we run the decoder is is exactly the same as before, and it's going to have all the same bugs as well, including the fact I have a I, I should I left that wire disconnected over here, so this is still going to show memory modeling failures, I should think. Um, but yeah, now you can see that when I run the decoder, there's no junk at the start of the file anymore um, because it doesn't take samples during the reset. Uh, the first samples it takes are just leading up to the actual reset itself. Uh, so that's nice, the samples start right at the beginning. But you can see it's worked fine, it's captured everything uh, even at 10 megahertz now um, and it's all looking good there. And we can search for the... Uh, I'm sure the memory modeling would have failed again. 
um, it's filled in a slightly different place because yeah you expect the memory modeling failure to to be random uh, when you've just disconnected a wire like that you don't it's not going to be a consistent failure now I wanted to show you one more thing that the logic analyzer and decoder combination can do for you and that's profiling your code and this is actually a really powerful thing to be able to do because the decoder can see all of the bus cycles that your program executed, it can tell you where your hotspots are in your code, like which instructions did the CPU spend most time executing. So what I've got here is a profile taken by the decoder, and it's showing down the left-hand side all of the addresses it ever saw the program counter equal to. This is not the instructions that were executed in order. Uh, all the instructions here are sorted by their memory address. And it says over here for each instruction, uh, the total number of bus cycles that were spent inside this instruction, uh, the, the percentage of all of the bus cycles that that was, uh, the number of times this instruction executed during the uh, execution of the program, and the, and the average number of cycles spent per instruction executed. Uh, here. So these ones at the top only executed once, so they're a bit boring, uh, but, but by the time you get down here you can see these instructions are executed multiple times, so they, so they must be in a loop or something like that. This this LDA has executed 80 times, and, it, and it's a two cycle instruction, uh, so that was 160 cycles overall, uh, but a tiny fraction of the actual uh, total time in the code. So as you scroll down you can see on the right hand side these stars start appearing and the stars are, are, are kind of like a bar graph uh, showing uh, proportionately how expensive each instruction was out of the overall execution time. Uh, these numbers are all pretty low here uh, but these ones are massive. Um, this is actually my Mandelbrot rendering program uh, in case you're interested. You're not going to really understand how it works just by looking at the profile here uh, but you can clearly see um, that this is really helpful for understanding uh, where the hotspots are. So if you wanted to make it faster, these are the places you would need to look. Um, you might look at uh, this LSR instruction. It's five cycles per instruction, so that's quite a slow instruction overall. Uh, and it executed over a million times. So, you know, if you wanted to optimize this, you'd probably want to try and find ways to reduce the number of times you execute it, uh, or use a cheaper instruction or something like that if you can. I mean, your options are always limited. You don't deliberately write slow code. But yeah, I really wanted to show you what this looks like so that you know the tools available, because that's the first step. There's a few different options for the profiling uh, to control uh, how it works, and you'll need to read up on those to get the best out of it. But I just wanted to make you guys aware that this exists, because it's an amazingly powerful tool, both for debugging and for profiling, uh, well worth checking out, well worth trying on your own systems. I honestly can't overstate how valuable this tool has been. It's a complete game changer, very easy to plug in and use. And I find it cuts through all of the difficulties of debugging and points to exactly what's wrong with my code in a way that's even more effective than modern PC debugging tools are. So it's absolutely fantastic and huge thanks to Dave Banks for all the work he's put into making this tool work uh, and others who've contributed to that project. Do check it out on GitHub. Uh, he's also got a wiki there where he's documented some things like how to set up the FX2, you know, all the wiring uh, for that. Uh, so yeah, really helpful stuff. So that's all I've got for you today. I hope it was interesting. As always, please let me know in the comments what you thought of the video. Uh, if you have any questions about this, do ask them. Uh, and do check out Dave Banks' GitHub. There's amazing stuff over there. And uh, I will see you in the next video.